You know, uh, religion comes to make a heavy weight on us, and yet the Holy Spirit comes to set us free and to empower us. Interesting, eh? We're in Acts, and the reason I like Acts is it's almost like a family reunion. There's a lot of weird things that happen in Acts. It's very similar to a family reunion. <laughs> In this book today, we're going to look at an unlikely convert. Someone who, if you would have met them before, you would have said, not happening. This person is definitely not on par for lining up with the Christian faith. And I thought, <clears throat> a lot of young couples are in those boots. They... Uh, Usually the woman gets this guy and in the back of her mind, she's thinking of all the things she's going to get him to change. She's going to convert him into the right way of living. And I'm like, sadly, reality doesn't play out that way. Usually guys don't get better. They usually get worse. What I thought is, a lot of marriages, I can only speak from my point of view, so take it for what it's worth. But I see a woman kind of wants a guy, something like, looks like Fabio, as tough as Chuck Norris, and has got the medical expertise of Dr. Quincy. But uh, most of us guys just don't measure up to that concept. Change can and does happen in life and in marriage, and you don't need to be converted. You know what, when change happens that's real and good and positive, it's when you love each other, when you let your love grow and you find yourself wanting the other person to live up to their best potential. That's what kind of change should happen. And you know what, this happens in an atmosphere of mutual care. The conversion and change happens almost naturally and organically because it has been built on love. Now there's some change that happens from handling life wrong. You lose your job, you start drinking heavily, become reclusive and distant, start lashing out at friends and soon you find yourself alone. And the reality is life is fragile. It's funny how little it takes to destroy a person. When you're not grounded in the gospel and you don't have the Holy Spirit guiding you and filling you and empowering you, it's easy to get your legs taken out from underneath you. Life has choices that leads to places. People say things like, I no longer believe that I have converted to such and such because such and such happened to me. So therefore, I quit. I'm doing something else. You make a choice to go to medical school and all of a sudden you find yourself standing in a clinic that you're the doctor in. Isn't that interesting? A choice. Over a span of a lifetime, the average person changes careers five to seven times, they say. Over 30% of the workforce changes jobs every 12 months. Unlikely converts, they're not being converted to what they're doing. They're unrest, they have unrest. Some people are open to doing this or that with no issues. Others are almost born with a direction and a purpose and a focus. You ever meet these people? They're actually, I remember thinking they were jerks. I remember thought, come on, buddy, we're in junior high. You can't know you're going to be a freaking cop. I don't even care what I'm going to do tomorrow. But no, there were some guys that, no, I'm going to go into the academy. Okay, good for you. <laughs> in Acts, we find a man by the name of Saul. In Acts chapter 9. And unfortunately, he was a very focused guy. Like that's... He was one of those people that had a plan. And actually, he didn't just have a plan. He lived it out. He made choices that put him there. And he wasn't letting anything stop him. 
Saul of Tarsus was born approximately AD 5 in the city of Tarsus in Sicilia. Modern day, anyone? Think of Thanksgiving and you'll get it. Turkey? <laughs> it wasn't a trick question. It was literally the obvious answer. Born to a Jewish parents that possessed Roman citizenship. And this was a coveted position or privilege. And Saul would grow up to actually have the same status as well. It said, uh, it's thought that around AD 10, Saul's family moved to Jerusalem. And Saul began his studies of Hebrew scripture under Rabbi Gamaliel, a teacher of the law that was respected and honored by the people. If you remember last time, we were talking about Ananias and Sapphira in Acts 5, and you can look up a little bit of history on, on uh, Gamaliel in Acts 5.34. It literally says he was an honored man, he was a respected teacher. So Paul's family had put him with the upper crust, with a very good education. Saul was studious, focused, and committed. All the trademarks for success were in his future. Let's just zoom ahead a little bit for a second here. Because I... This is a soul that was, I'm going to be in the academy. I'm going to be the number one guy. But then years later, Philippians 3, 5, and 6 says, he's bragging about his credentials, but not really from a positive standpoint. He's saying, I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I am a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew. Is there any other kind? I guess there is. He's bragging, I am a real Hebrew. And then he finishes it off by saying, if there ever was one. <laughs> I'm the guy, dude. I was a member of the Pharisees who demanded the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. If that's something to brag about, he was bragging about it. He was committed to being a Pharisee. Saul was groomed to be among the ruling class of Jews. Saul was a Pharisee and the son of a Pharisee. Acts 23, 6 says that. The Pharisees were a religious group with a lot of power. You gotta ask yourself, how much has changed? from then to now. Usually the bigger the religious group, the less the spirit of God and the power of God is allowed to move in their midst. And I sense the exact opposite here. I sense, man, I sit back and I think, wow, you can see God moving. You see the spirit of God touching people's lives and minds and actually igniting what? Hope. Hope for a better tomorrow. Hope that my life matters. Hope that he sees me. The funny thing is, Jesus Christ was not overly impressed with the Pharisees. <laughs> it's almost funny in a way, considering he's God and they're a religious group. So in Matthew 23, 4, it says, they crush people with unbearable religious demands and never lift a finger to ease the burden. Matthew 23, 25 says, what sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you are so careful to clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are filthy, full of greed and self-indulgence. Okay, this is the group Paul or Saul was a member of. He was, he was zealous at being what? Jesus said, you're filthy, you're full of greed, and you're self-indulgent. So Paul or Saul was excelling at this, I guess. <laughs> These were what Jesus said. And Saul was a Pharisee. He was a committed religious person who felt good about his accomplishments. 
That sounds religious to me. A lot of people in churches, the way the churches are set up, I'm sure a lot of them are well-meaning. But a lot of them are set up in a way with lots of boxes. And you spend your time checking the boxes so that you can look at your neighbor and go, maybe someday you'll be able to check this box. Like me. Do you want to hear me pray? I, I really got some good ones. He had achieved. He had excelled. And he had risen to the upper echelon of the religious circle of the day. And guess what? He wasn't done. He had his sights set on bigger and better. And you say, you're fantasizing, Sam. You're making this up. And I say, let me prove thee wrong. Acts 8, 1 to 3. We see Saul thought he was being a good person by collecting all those Christian rebels that followed this thing called the way. What is interesting is that the Pharisees, listen to this, the Pharisees were the best and worst people. On one hand, they were holy men who kept the law. Don't forget, they kept the law. They pursued purity with passion and wanted nothing more than to live lives that pleased God. Unfortunately, they were misguided in their journey. They were what? They were cold, legalistic, and self-serving. They focused on things like, now these are deep spiritual things. Should a mother pick up her child on the Sabbath? Is that work or is it not work? These are deep things that took a lot of their time. <laughs> How far can I walk on the Sabbath before I start walking sinfully? Because at a certain point, it's, just, it's too much, isn't it? It's work. And I'm like, look out, Batman. This is scary. But really, what's changed today? In a lot of circles, nothing's changed. The religious organization is self-effort, self-powered, self-endowed, and self-honored. But that's not God. We know that God says, I, what kind of person? I want a broken and contrite person I will never despise, I will never cast away. That almost fits everyone here in that category. It's when you think you've arrived that you may want to check the map. You're off base. But when you're broken and you're saying, God, I don't think I measure up. I don't think I qualify. That's when he said, I'll never reject you because I'm going to equip you. I'm going to empower you. I'm going to lead you. It's going to be my life in you, not your ingenuity. Why do we hear the, actually forget the phrase. Why do statistics tell us pastors burn out? Why do church workers burn out? You run out of ideas eventually. <laughs> so it's like, I'm human. I, ain't, I only got so many tricks in the bag. But when you say, God, I'm human. Start the, start the trip off that way first. Walk to the altar, say, God, I'm human. I quit high school, so that already limits what's in the bag. I'm in construction. That again lowers you a little more lower on the totem pole. But you say, God, the key phrase, the last song we sang, here I am. Here I am. You see that throughout the Bible. Here I am. I'm a cursing, drunkard. I, I stretch the truth sometimes. Here am I. I'm potty in your hand, God. I need to see your power or I'm going to fall flat on my face. And you know what? He says, okay, that's the person I'm willing to work with. Paul, or Saul, he couldn't work with him. We're going to see what had to happen first. Saul had it made. He thought he was doing a great thing when he's persecuting the Christians. <laughs> 
People that think they can win their way to heaven just by being good are misguided. And you almost want to feel sorry for them. You know what? In reality, there is no way to measure up to perfection without the covering and cleansing power of Jesus Christ's blood. How do you measure up to perfection? I can't. I'm just not that good. Maybe there's some that would think they are. Sadly mistaken. <laughs> Matthew 23, 28 says, Outwardly, you look like righteous people. I wish I was paraphrasing this, but I'm not. Outwardly, you look like righteous people, but inwardly, your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. Oh, that's depressing for any real religious person. Like, are you telling me all my religious activity means nothing? Yes! It means absolutely nothing. There was the religious group Saul had become entangled with and completely committed to. And you know what? Because he was so committed, he even wanted to be on the A-team. He said, I want to be special forces Pharisee. And they're like, okay. So he's like, I think I'll go after the Christians. That would make me the super elite. And Saul was a man with some serious convictions. Don't forget, he had serious convictions. He had religious convictions. Why do you think you argue with someone that doesn't believe in the Bible? Well, they have convictions. They have convictions that what they're following, that rock is powerful. That tree they're bowing to, well, that's, that is God to them. They're misguided. But it doesn't mean they don't have some serious convictions. And you know what? Paul, or Saul at this point, was not to be taken lightly. He was a man on a mission, and he was willing to do what it took to complete his mission. And it says in Acts 9, 1 and 2, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way. I like that, that label. They belong to the way. Whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. And there's a guy that I heard about many years ago. His name was Lee Strobel. I don't know if any of you heard of him. He wrote a book called Case for Christ. He was the legal editor for the Chicago Tribune. And he was a person who was known for his skepticism, saying, I need evidence before I believe anything. Well, him and his wife were living the upper class life. He was an atheist, she was agnostic. He was sure he believed in nothing. She wasn't sure she believed in nothing. <laughs> but you know what? She started going to this Bible group that she got invited to. And eventually, she became a believer. And I love what Lee Strobel said. He said, I thought this was the worst thing that could happen. I'm like, that's the best you can come up with? That's the worst thing? But he said, I thought this was it. Our marriage is over. She'll become a, this is his own words, by the way. I'm not making this up. She'll become a sexually repressed prude, spending all her time on skid row serving the poor. And he said, to his surprise, he's seen positive changes. When she was interacting with the kids, things were going better. When she was acting or interacting with him, he said, this is his own words, he said it was winsome and it was attractive. But, being a good atheist, he said, I went to church with her once and he said, honestly, the real reason I was going was trying to get her away from the cult. I wanted to get her out of there. But he said he left feeling, man, that pastor made a lot of sense. You know, Jesus Christ came to set me free. He came to forgive all my sins. It sounded actually pretty good. But he's, being a man, 
There's no way he's following a map that looks like it makes sense. He's doing his own thing. So I believe it was one of his workers at work said, you say you're an atheist. You're a legal editor for a huge paper. Why don't you take your education and your training to disprove Jesus Christ and the gospel? And he said, okay. Well, he went on a quest to disprove Christianity. He was a devout atheist, but after one year, nine months later, his legal training and expertise into investigating the credibility of Christianity, he came to the conclusion that Jesus Christ not only died, but rose from the grave. Something he said, I, I, I'm going by memory here, but I think he said, there's more evidence to prove that Jesus Christ not only died and rose, there's more evidence to prove that than there is evidence to prove that Julius Caesar ever lived. So he was overwhelmed by the evidence and the tangible reality of Jesus Christ, the risen Messiah. And Saul was on a collision course with the risen Messiah, Jesus Christ. Saul had religion, but he had crashed head on into the person of Jesus Christ. Lee Strobel was a blatant atheist serving and caring only for his needs and wants, both encountered the power of Jesus Christ in an undeniable way. Acts 9, 6. Now, I don't know if you know the part where Acts 9, where Saul is going along and a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell on the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are, you, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And a voice, a voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. I like how the next verse goes. <laughs> I'm Jesus. I'm the one you're persecuting. What are you doing? Then he says, now get up. First, I'm going to knock you down. Don't forget who knocked him down. Jesus knocked him down. Then he says, get up. Stop being a baby. Get up. I'm taking you somewhere. <coughs> Go to the place. So Saul had his eyes blinded with this encounter. And God says, Go to the place where I will open your eyes to the reality of who I am. God is not interested with ceremonial rituals, but in a heart that is surrendered to his will. My personal bet is this, Saul is in shock. I would be in devastating shock. I've just been knocked on my face. I've heard the voice of God. He's telling me I'm Jesus Christ, the one I'm persecuting. And the meanwhile, I'm thinking, well, this is the guy that I've been going after. It's his followers that I've been going after. I'd be in shock a little bit. I'd be a little scared, actually. He's probably overwhelmed. There's like 400 reels in your heads. Here's another reel in his head. Everything he had been taught Everything he had believed was on the chopping block. Everything he had been taught, everything his psyche had been programmed to think was wrong. It was on the chopping block. How do you think that feels? I believed a lie my whole life. I was committed to a lie my whole life. The very thing he had been fighting was the truth. Philippians 3.8 says, everything wise is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. That's what Saul said later in life. Everything is nothing in comparison to my relationship with Jesus Christ. 
the revelation that he has given to me in my heart, in my mind, the power he has given me to walk through the furnace, to endure hardship, to love unconditionally. I could never do before, but now it comes naturally. You know what? These things are almost a litmus test for us to say to ourselves, how much of a Christian am I or how religious am I? Acts 9, 10 to 20. When Jesus gets a hold of you, you are changed. You know what? To be run over by the grace of God is a wonderful thing. To have the truth of Jesus Christ was worth all the suffering Saul would face. In reality, it was nothing to Saul because he had the life of Christ in him. You notice that without the fuel, the engine don't run so good. And I have to think, I wonder if God blinded Saul on the road to Damascus to show him that he had lived his entire life in the dark and out of touch with the very thing he had proclaimed to possess. Religion goes through ceremonial motions and movements and all kinds of baloney, but there's no stirring. There's no passion. It's a form. And that's very biblical because it says they have a form of godliness, but it denies the power of God. What do you hear? You hear it sometimes on the radio. Guys will get so theological, you know they're idiots. It's like, wow, God did that back then, but there's no way he would do it now. That was just to confirm blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, that's funny because my Bible says God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. I need to know that or I can't walk tomorrow. I can't face tomorrow. I need to know God is going to hold me up tomorrow. I need to know he's going to walk with me tomorrow or else what I'm believing is a joke. At some point, Saul was no longer his identity name or his identifying name, I mean. He became known as Paul the Apostle. Think about that. I like that. And I was reading some commentaries and they were saying, well, that's not, there's nothing there to prove that, you know, that had anything to do with his conversion. I'm like, so what? Who cares if it had anything to do with his conversion? You know what? Because I heard it. I came from a small town. You know what small towns like to do to you? You become a Christian. And what do they do? Hey, remember the time you did such and such? That's who you are, bro. Those are usually the people from church that do that, actually. So you stole any bikes lately? Uh, no. Got hammered and puked all over your driveway, I bet, this weekend? No, I didn't. Sometimes the religious are the ones that kill the newborns. Saul was his name, but it no longer was his identifying name. Paul was his new slate. The Bible says, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, you have become a new creation. All things old have passed away. You have the seal of the Holy Spirit in your life. When the enemy says, I know your identity, that's what you are. You're a thief, you're a crook, you're this or that or whatever. You go, no, that's, that's not my identifying name anymore. That's not who I am anymore. That could be a lifelong battle. <laughs> when there's real change in a person's life, the Bible says you become a new creation. Paul had been an unlikely candidate for becoming a follower of Jesus Christ. But when he got knocked down and felt the personal touch of Jesus Christ, the risen Messiah, religion fell to the wayside and he was transformed. He was filled with the Holy Spirit 
and became a dynamic foundational member of the Christian faith. Think about that. Acts 9.20. It's somewhere here. And immediately he began preaching about Jesus in the synagogue, saying, he is indeed the Son of God. Wow. <laughs> From rags to riches. Paul literally gets up. Oh man, I've been an idiot my whole life. By the way, Jesus Christ is the risen Savior. He's the Son of God. And I'm going to all these religious places and I'm going to set them straight. The guy had passion. I'll give him that. But I love the fact that he didn't, you know, like they, like a lot of places are going to say, well, no, 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 no. Slow down, bro. Slow down. Don't slow down. You know what? Jeremiah says, it burns inside of me because even though it's been a place of, when I talk about the gospel, it hurts because people make fun of me, laugh at me, persecute me. He said, I try to suppress it, but I can't. It burns in me. I got to speak it out. And I'm like, that should be our prayer. That's why we need the Holy Spirit. We don't need religion. We need the Holy Spirit. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. We need the equipping of the Holy Spirit. Or all we are doing is having an alternate version of a bowling club without the ball or the alleyway. And to me, that's pointless. When you have the fire of God in you, you can't keep it to yourself. We had already read, religion is cold and non-emotional, but fire gets you up and moving. If you don't believe me, stick your hand in it and see how it, what it does to you. Fire gets you moving. It'll get you jumping. You know what? Save your reservations. Save your dignity for the great white throne day. <laughs> you know what? When you're full of the Holy Spirit, you do want to jump around. You do want to shout. And like Jesse stood up and said, I want to make a public vow. You know what? Sometimes I wonder. I, I often say to people, you know what? If I don't have a guitar in my hand, I ain't moving. <laughs> it's like, I don't feel comfortable doing that stuff. But sometimes I wonder if we shouldn't be making a public declaration saying, this is who I am, devil. I used to pray this when I was in my most desperate state of feeling like I was alone on this planet and forsaken by all. I remember saying, God, I have enough strength to say this, devil, you're gonna have to put the gun right here and squeeze the trigger because if you don't, I'm gonna keep talking about you or about God and the power of the gospel. So you wanna take me out? There's only one way, you gotta finish the job. You stripped me of almost everything, but you left me breathing. So I'm gonna keep talking. It's okay to get stubborn. You know what, when you've experienced God, don't do yourself the disservice of saying nothing. You know how you get the devil mad? Start talking about what a loser he is. He knows his end, or else it wouldn't say he knows his end is short, or his time is short. He knows it. Some Christians don't know that. They think he's got all kinds of time and all kinds of power. But he knows his time is short. He's not trying to win. He's trying to drag you down. He's trying to drag me down. He's got no delusions that he's going to win this. He knows he's a loser. Paul and Lee Strobel were two unlikely converts for the simple fact that they were so self-absorbed with their own efforts and accomplishments. They had many reasons to feel good about themselves. I've done this, I've done that. I've actually heard guys say that. I'm like, good for you. I haven't done very much, but I'm limping along. And then something happened a few weeks ago and I wanted to share it. There's one last story of an unlikely convert. And she was a friend of mine. She was, she, this girl was a Christian for almost her entire life. I actually can't remember her not being a Christian. And when I was young, I remember watching her thinking, I wonder why she's even a believer. I remember thinking that. 
I wonder why she's a believer. You know, I knew her whole family. We went to the same church. We grew up around each other's families. And well, I was living like a rebel. She was serving the Lord and being a kind-hearted person. If I'm honest, I'm not gonna lie, I want this story to hurt you. It hurt me. A lot of times we talk to God like as if he owes us something and we put conditions and caveats on our Christian walk. She didn't do that. She never did that. She never said, God, if you do this, then I'll be a Christian. And when I thought about it, I thought, wow, if I ever seen an unlikely convert, it would be her. Even though she accepted Jesus at a very young age and never really strayed, and she even died being positive and caring. And then you say, well, what's wrong with that? What made me think of her as an unlikely convert were the facts. The facts, just the facts. Although she was kind to everyone, I can't remember most people being kind back to her. She wasn't the most popular girl in the room. She wasn't the kind of girl that caught your eye because of her beauty, but yet she was precious to God. You know what, she had her fair share of reasons to lay down and say, I quit. Actually, she had a lot of reasons and I wouldn't even say most of them here. On many levels, her life wasn't easy. And you know what, I'm actually glad she's finally in the arms of a savior that will never make fun of her, never overlook her, never leave her out on account that she's not cool enough. Because she loved Jesus, she kept caring and sharing because that's who she was till the day she died. I thought it was interesting. She would comment on every one of my kids' birthdays on Facebook. I remember I'd say happy birthday to Joseph or someone and she would throughout the day at some point she's going to say have a great day Joseph and I'd be like she's never met him she doesn't even know who he is but that's who she was because she loved Jesus she kept caring and sharing She was the kind of person who would try to help you even at her own expense. She knew the sting of betrayal and being overlooked. She was an unlikely convert. If she had been a shallow person, her faith would have faltered. If she had all kinds of, well, I'll follow you, God, if she would have quit. I guarantee it. She loved, she cared, she encouraged others because Jesus had her in his arms long before she ever left this planet. She had met the master years before at a young age. Although she was minimalized by the world, she is today feeling the hugs and kisses from her heavenly father who hasn't stopped saying to her, well done, daughter. Well done, my child. You have been my hands and feet for 54 years. If we start looking at things in the right perspective, all of a sudden it changes everything. She never got the accolades here. She never got the rewards here. She never probably got acknowledged most times here. And yet today, I got a clear picture of God saying, 
I haven't stopped holding her and telling her she was my hands, my feet for 54 years. She was faithful. Life isn't fair. Life here isn't just. The Lord revealed to Paul what? Oh, you're going to have a Cadillac. You're going to drive a Lamborghini. You're going to have your own TV show. You're going to be the most popular and loved guy on the planet because of me. No. He said, the Lord revealed to Paul all the things he would suffer because of his commitment to Jesus Christ. In some ways, we are all unlikely converts. Because without the love of Christ drawing us to himself, we would go our own way, feeling good about our evil actions. Saul was doing his thing and he thought he was okay. He was excelling at going the opposite direction. Without Christ, we are satisfied to be lost in a sea of reasoning and intellectual babble. But Christ's love changes everything. Go out and be bold. Be compassionate. Be strong. And wrap it all with love, no matter the reception of the hearer. When you meet Jesus, he will make every wrong that has been done to you right. Every pain will disappear. Why? Because you are loved. He has never left you alone. He has always been calling you home. Unlikely convert, it's me. But he changed my destiny. He got in my face. And he said, there's hope and no other thing but me. So Lord, we, we, uh, we realize that our own efforts and our own achievements don't add up to a whole hill of beans. And it's only through your power and your love and your life in us that we can go anywhere and do anything that has any consequence. Help us to be like Paul that said, hey, when I'm weak, then his power is super strong through me. Because his grace is sufficient for my weakness. I can't do it. I can't do it all. But I can rely on you in all. So God, empower each person here. I pray that each person here knows the love of the Father in a tangible way, that they sense your arms of love, compassion, encouragement, all the things that we fall short of doing for each other. You don't. You have endless love, endless encouragements, endless power, endless, endless ideas. So God, I just pray your power, your anointing, and the freedom of your spirit to move here, Lord. In your name we pray, amen.